and I'm talking about Goodbye Solo. Uh, mm, just yeah. yeah, have you read about this one? Yeah, I actually have. I read about it because the director um, did Man Pushcart, and um, what's the other film? Is um, Chop well, let me Chop. tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Top Chef. So this guy is very popular. There's an article about these films in the New York Times Magazine this past weekend. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Roger Ebert, just this week, Roger mm-hmm. Ebert called our next guest the new great American director. And in his first two films, like you mentioned, Man Push Cart and Chop Shop, writer-director Ramin Barani explored the lives of fascinating characters who live on the fringes of society. And he did it with great compassion and sensitivity. And those qualities also define... This new film of his, Goodbye Solo, which has already won the International Critics Prize at the Venice Film Festival. Uh, honestly, as a, as a young kid, I, I didn't really watch a lot of films. Um, my parents weren't really movie-going people very much. Uh, I mean, my earliest memories of my parents, um, you know, taking us to see films were, you know, like all kids of my generation. We, you know, me and my brother went to see Star Wars, and right. um, my mom was a fan of James Bond. Um, so we would watch those every year, but we didn't really watch a lot of movies, to tell you the truth. Um, I started watching more more movies by the time I was in high school. I had a teacher who um, uh, started introducing me to American films of the 70s, mm. um, Woody Allen, Scorsese, Coppola, you know, th- those kind of directors, and that kind of opened up ideas about cinema that I didn't really know about before and sh- showed me kind of movies that I didn't know about before. Yeah. You know a name I, I often hear associated with you in terms of other filmmakers, and I don't know if you consider this a, a fair comparison or not, is, is Cassavetes. Yeah, of course. I, I do like Cassavetes. Um, I mean, our, our styles are different, but the, there are a lot of similarities, which is, for example, um, you know, women are the influence. People tend to think it's improvised acting or improvised scenes, but actually we all know that those things were very choreographed, very well planned out. Mm-hmm. None of Gina Rowland's performance is a improvisation. And um, so I, I think the naturalism that he brought is certainly um, not just in his camera style, but in his performance and storytelling. I think we do share those similarities. Yeah, yeah. And what were you trying to investigate with this project? Well, Goodbye Solo, believe it or not, um, the original script and um, idea was beginning in 2005. After Man Push Card had premiered in Venice, I was already working on Chop Shop, but at the same time I was working on Goodbye Solo. Um, I had met a real-life Senegalese taxi driver in a pickup soccer match I played with my brother in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is where I'm born and raised. Um, mm-hmm. I had met this driver actually even earlier, in about 2003. He was young, friendly, charming. And during the soccer match, I came to see there were a lot of Africans and a lot of taxis. And I realized that Africans were driving a lot of the taxis in Winston-Salem, which I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And, and having been out of Winston for a couple of years, the demographics of the South were changing. Um, I then saw the same driver in a... In a um, gas station. He was a gas station attendant as a second job. And I came to learn that he didn't own a car. And so this taxi driver, to get to his other job or to get anywhere, had to hire a taxi or he had to walk. And the idea of a a dark-skinned African man walking in Winston-Salem, North Carolina and having to hire taxis to take him to his job as a taxi driver seemed really interesting to me. And um, flash forward to 2005, I, I... connected this with an elderly man, and um, little by little started to develop the story of of Goodbye Solo. Mm. And you actually, obviously you're from Winston-Salem, you actually rode with with this gentleman for about six weeks, if if I have that correct. Is that right? I I actually spent about six months with him um, over the course of a couple of years, before Chomp Chomp, after Chomp Chomp, and then right before we were going to make Goodbye Solo. and, and in that, in the process, I came to, you know, learn more about the details of the business, learn more about the passengers. Um, also, this gentleman, just, he was very charming. He was very friendly. Nothing in the film, actually, the majority of the story of the film is completely fictional and is not from his real life, but he had a feeling and an atmosphere that, that permeated the script and then the film itself. Um, 
which then another gentleman named Suleiman ended up being cast to play the lead. Uh, he's a trained actor, but it's his first, it's kind of his debut film, really. Mm. Uh, had you always wanted to make a film in, in Winston-Salem? I kind of did. I knew I would always go, you know, return and, and make a film in my hometown, uh, and I always had a feeling it would be something that we wouldn't expect from Winston-Salem. Mm-hmm. There's a, a scene in the movie where Solo is, is driving and there's a crack passenger in the back seat, um, a middle-aged um, Caucasian man with a, a younger black girl and they're smoking up in the back. And this gentleman is actually being, being played by Angus McLaughlin, who is a friend and also a playwright and a screenwriter. He, sp- he was a screenwriter of Junebug, mm. which Phil Morrison made in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, because Angus and Phil are both from Winston-Salem also. Mm. And Angus said something very interesting to me, which is he said, you could show Junebug and Goodbye Solo back-to-back. Nobody would believe they're the same town, and they're both completely honest and accurate about that town. What I tried to show was a part of Winston-Salem that I personally didn't know growing up. Mm-hmm. In fact, in the making of the film, like in all my films, I come to learn about people and a portion of a city or a portion of a society that I personally didn't know about, and that's one of the things that excites me to make the films. Yeah. Um, you know, unlike New York, if you're going to take a taxi, uh, you know, people who take taxis in New York tend to be a little bit more, you know, well-to-do financially. In a suburb like Winston-Salem, North Carolina, if you're taking a taxi, it means you can't afford a car or you can't afford car insurance or you can't afford to repair a car, all the things that go with a car. So 90% of the customers were, were financially not really well off. Um, yeah. Occasionally, you would get someone who had to go to a, you know, uh, airport or their car broke down and it was a rare thing for them. So, And I was also doing the night shift with this driver. So we were taking a lot of people to and from, you know, third, third shift jobs, um, you know, really, really working class people, um, oftentimes quite poor. Uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, that was predominantly African Americans and Hispanics, and then occasionally, um, you know, very, very working class uh, Caucasians as well. And this was a portion of the city I didn't know much about. And yeah. um, I, it I found to, it really exciting to learn about it. Yeah, it had to be very kind of cathartic for you in a way to to rediscover the, the people of your hometown. Uh, that's what it sounds like to me. Very much so, and I mean, it's also, the, 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 the film has, you know, represent, represents the changing demographics of the South. You have to remember North Carolina voted for Obama, and this could not have happened four years ago or eight years ago or 12 years ago. And um, I say all this cautiously um, because you know my films and you know me as a filmmaker. The film is not a message film. Because um, for those of you who don't know the story, the story is about Solo, who wants to, who is hired in the very beginning of the film by William, an old Southern man who wants to, Solo to take him to a mountaintop called Blowing Rock in two weeks' time, where he plans to jump and kill himself. Now, on paper, we may be talking about this film, and suddenly the audience may think to themselves, "Oh, this is going to be like a angelic black guy comes to save old white guy, or the Bucket right. List, or Legend of Bagger Vance, or..." A, and the movie's not like that at all. In fact, I don't like those films. And, and if you've seen my other films, you know that that's not what you're going to get. But for those, right. those people in your audience who don't know, I want to really stress that's not what this film is. Well, some, something that all of your films have in common, they're just, they feature just extraordinary performances and performers. And, and, and this is an interesting duo, your two leads here. Uh, how did you happen upon them? Yeah, it's the first time that my leads are... are professionally trained actors. In the past, my leads have always been non-professionally trained. Mm-hmm. The supporting casting did by Solo is all non-professional, local, non-actors that have been put into the film. Um, Solo, Suleiman, his nickname is Solo, um, he, we looked in North Carolina. When the real guy said he didn't want to be in the film, we had to find somebody to play the part. And so we looked in North Carolina, L.A. Tapes came from various African countries. Tapes came from England. I went to France. And one day, Solo came into the office in New York Physically, he was perfect. He was charming, friendly, open, curious. And believe it or not, he had been a flight attendant for two years for Air Afrique. And in the script, the character's dream is to become a flight attendant. So it was almost, you know, too good to be true. It was like such a crazy coincidence. And um, so he, playing the part of Solo, he has an amazing face and, and um, is a great performance. The other character, the old man, William, is played by Red West. 
Yeah. You don't know Red West. Red West is Elvis Presley's childhood best friend. I'm talking back when Elvis was a scrawny kid getting, you know, beaten up in school. This was the guy protecting him. Mm. And when Elvis became Elvis, Red became part of the Memphis Mafia, part of his personal bodyguard. And then Elvis became a stuntman and a bit player in a lot of the Elvis films. When Elvis passed, Red West went on to become a, a Hollywood character actor, working yeah. with Coppola, Altman, Oliver Stone, and in big Hollywood fare like Roadhouse and Glory Road. And this is actually his first leading role at the age of 71, which I, I'm especially proud to, to say that it's in this film. It's a big honor for me to work with him. Yeah, just reading about uh, these two actors, it's an amazing, uh, amazing duo and amazing life journeys that both of them have had. Uh, you as a director, when, when you are working and collaborating with these actors, what is your, what is your process uh, with them? Do you spend a lot of time in rehearsals? I do a lot of rehearsals. Here the process was a little different. Um, in, my, in the past and with all the supporting cast of Goodbye Solo and in my previous films, I never show the script. Mm. Um, there's a very detailed script. Everything in the film is pretty planned out and pretty meticulously planned out and usually repeated over and over again in many takes and very detailed script. Here I showed the two leads the script, and I've never done that before. Um, they were both better performers with the script, which was different for me but I respected that they were better that way, and I had to move myself to match them. Mm -hmm. um, Solo came to live with me and my brother for three months in North Carolina and actually drove a taxi. And I mean really drove a taxi to make money with real mm -hmm. customers. And, and he really got into the business of it. He learned the people. He met the real driver, which helped his performance, I think. He, part of the rehearsal, for example, in the film he's married and has a stepdaughter, and the stepdaughter is the third biggest part in the film, Initial rehearsals with the stepdaughter was just them going and having lunch together. Yeah. Spending time, becoming really friends, and then some feeling of possibly, you know, in real life maybe she would look at Solo as her uncle, or something like that that would really make their bond in the film something special. Yeah. Um, and then Red West came for a couple of weeks before the film, and, and we rehearsed extensively. Um, I remember when Red showed up, he asked me if we were going to do a table reading. And I asked him, I don't, I said, what is a table reading? I didn't even know. Yeah. And he proceeded to tell me that it was to sit at a table and read the script. And I said, well, Red, with all due respect, I, I, I don't know what that is, and it doesn't seem like a movie to me. Can we just rehearse the scenes on location with my cameraman, a handy cam, and the actors in the space? And he said, oh, well, I'm open to that idea. And that's how I tend to work. I, I like to rehearse extensively with the actors on location with a handy cam. That, that seems that's, like I think the beginning true. of the process, you know? Yeah. And you, when you talked about how he spent time with, with the, the stepdaughter character, and, and um, that reminds me of so, someone else, how they work. And, and uh, Mr. West has worked with this gentleman, Coppola. Uh, yeah. Re rehearsals for him, it's more about establishing a comfort zone with one another because the the whole company there has such a family feeling in, in every one of his films. I think that's more valuable than sitting and reading the lines together, certainly. I think so, too. There's a character named Brock um, who plays, he's a real taxi driver, who plays um, Solo's best friend in the film, and they spent time together. They went shop pool together. They had drinks together, um, and that was part of the rehearsal with him. I would stress, by the way, Rock insists that his name is not R-O-C-K, it is R-O-C, because K is for killing and C is for chilling, and Rock is a chiller, he says. And in the film, he's not only his best friend, he's also a, a drug dealer. <laughs> so he wants to say that he's a chiller. Uh, let me tell you, let me ask you about the, uh, the film festival experience. Uh, you've had tremendous success with all of your films, uh, and, and this one in particular won the International Critics Prize in Venice, I believe. Uh, yeah. What what is the value of that beyond getting the word and the exposure out about your film? What what do you learn about your film and your audience by by attending those festivals? Well, it's always a good chance, especially um, I, I've premiered all my films in Europe: Man Push Card in Venice, Chow Shop in Cannes, and then Solo again in Venice. And then I premiere in um, the States after that. One, I like to see the reaction in in different countries. Uh -huh. um, especially the difference between Europe and America, if there are differences, what they might be. I always like seeing the film where the movie was shot. For example, Pushcart and Chomp Chomp, I was always curious to see what would New York audience think of it. 
in April, I'm going to be in River Run Film Festival in North Carolina where the movie was shot in Winston. So I'm very curious what Winston-Salem will think. Um, Specifically with Solo, it was a pleasure and a relief to know that the humor worked. Unlike my first two films, this one has quite a bit of humor, especially in the first half of the film. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if it was a smiling humor, a chuckling humor, or a kind of laughing humor. Mm. And we were relieved that it was kind of a laughing humor for about half the film. And I wasn't really expecting it to be that, for people to think it was this humorous. And that was a kind of a, a real relief. And, and always there's a, a audience members that, that will pose you a question or tell you a feeling they had that you never really knew about, that you even knew was in the film. Mm-hmm. And so that's always a great pleasure with meeting audiences because you learn something new about your film. And then I have to confess, I take that and I go to the next festival and I pretend, I pretend like I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thank the audiences for that. They they always give me good kind of quotes to give in interviews and yeah, Q&As. Yeah, great, great sound.